thanks again for everybody joining. Oh, there it went. I just had the little the little note say recording in progress. So now I'll start that the recording is in progress. So good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Shane Caldwell, and I'm the director of the EVA program and delighted that you're with us for our February uh, buyer user group meeting, February 15th, 2023. Got a couple uh, agenda items uh, to, to go over today, uh, kind of switching from hyper care to extended care. Um, a little discussion about that and what that means as we begin to get closer and closer to our steady state uh, and kind of get out of the implementation phase. We're getting close. Um, for those of you that aren't aware, I hope everybody is, but you never know. We went live on um, November 1st and, you know, still uh, providing a lot of support and getting people kind of switched over our training. Uh, our virtual instructor-led training has restarted, which is great. We've been doing that throughout February, and um, but we still uh, have a fair amount of staff uh, beyond even the EVA team uh, all across DPS providing support, but we are starting to break that down just a little bit and trying to get ourselves back to what we call our steady state, where our uh, excellent, excellent staff uh, with EVA customer care will be your original point of contact for issues. And then um, your ability to reach out to your account exec and other members of the EVA team, kind of getting back to those grassroots outreach and things that we've done. Uh, but again, we'll talk about that in a sec, but just a kind of a little overview there on that first bullet. The next one is a discussion about EVA release management. Talk a little bit about some changes we're making, how that impacts you, and then go over our most recent, recent releases. And as um, Kim did a little introduction and kind of setting the stage for what the user group meeting is all about uh, and what it was uh, for those of you that used to attend before we did this transition, because the user group has really been about new EVA, new EVA, new EVA, transition, transition, transition for months and months and months and months and months. But really the idea of the user group is around release management. And when we talk about releases, that's when we make an enhancement or a change, or we fix something uh, in the EVA platform, right? And what the user group allows us to do is we can come in and talk about those changes, talk about those enhancements, uh, talk about the new things that we're doing and demo those things to you. Uh, and really that's that's why we do this meeting. It's, it's a chance for us to come to you. Um, you know, we're hearing from you um, outside of the user group, right? From all sorts of different avenues through customer care, through your, through your account executive, through direct contact uh, with DPS in some form or fashion or, or with directly with the EVA team. And, you know, those are all coming together and then we're making changes and updates and maybe we're launching new functionality. Um, and that's really what, you know, the user group was started for to, to keep you guys informed of what's going on. Um, so we're going to discuss release management and really, um, you know, as we, get further and further away from the transition date, it will be more of that for this user group. Demonstrations, walkthroughs, discussion of, of new things we're seeing or adjustments we've made to the tool. So excited to kind of get back into that flow and really what the user group is about. You guys are users and we're showing you things that are impacting you as users. And then in that vein, uh, one of the areas we've noticed um, just to kind of you know, clear up any confusion uh, folks might have and just kind of show you, um, you know, some areas uh, around electronic order delivery and what that means uh, and how you can uh, look for things around electronic order delivery. So those are our three uh, topics for today and uh, hope to, you know, keep us here uh, within the hour. Uh, so we hit, you know, nice and tight. And uh, then, you know, again, Kim gets this recorded for you. You can go out watch the recording uh, after the fact or share it uh, within your organization. So let's dig into this concept of hyper care to extended care. All right. So if you've been with us, you know, going into the uh, November 1st uh, go live date, um, if you've been with us for these user group meetings, once we started them back up after the transition, 
you might have heard us call our support in as we were supporting this transition, hypercare. Uh, and hypercare um, really was a term, you know, we stole uh, from out in the, uh, you know, out in the web world, out in the Google world. Um, and it was really about an all hands effort to support the transition uh, from our legacy EVA system into our current or new EVA platform. And um, I mean, quite honestly, folks from all around uh, the Department of General Services and certainly a lot of staff at the Division of Purchases and Supply at DPS were involved in hypercare. Uh, there weren't too many people that weren't um, in some form or fashion. And um, we are moving, we're not done with our larger teams and, and some of our support areas, but we are beginning to shrink those back down and beginning to, to look at and work ourselves towards steady state. So just some quick notes about that and kind of a, how does it impact me? Well, from a support perspective, uh, we hope you don't notice any difference. Um, we're still supporting our major functional components in EVA with dedicated support teams. That's your requisitions, POs, receiving, sourcing contracts, and quite honestly, login and access to the system, um, you know, from our supplier community. Um, we also, our customer care team has been directly supporting our suppliers um, with uh, electronic response, making sure they're comfortable in that switch to electronic response. And then we also have our we call them our vendor support team or our supplier support team. We tend to use the term supplier more than we ever have uh, when we're talking about that. And, you know, those teams are still in place. They're not going anywhere. Um, still very, very focused. Uh, and this focus around hypercare remains on issue collection and resolution, right? Uh, you know, if we're, if we're seeing uh, issues, seeing things we need to fix, seeing things we need to correct. So those teams are very, very, very much focused on that. We did have some teams roll off. Um, we know there's a lot more for those of you that are potentially in procurement shops, leadership roles. Um, you know, you're getting some outreach directly. I, I call it grassroots. Uh, from your account executive, maybe you're working directly with a member uh, on my team on a particular training initiative or a setup or things like that that you're doing. Uh, and then you might be having uh, separate meetings, um, either directly with your account executive or with a mix of folks uh, at DPS, you know, to discuss issues and, and all sorts of things uh, that go beyond EVA uh, that could have a procurement impact. And we know those those types of things are happening as well. I also know our account executives have been getting out on the road uh, and meeting with some of you and, and, and you know, some of that pre-transition um, outreach and work is starting up in earnest. And that's a more um, natural way that we support you guys as clients. It's not just through getting a ticket in. Um, so we're seeing a little shift there. Uh, but again, if you have a, a, a critical issue, if you have a bug, you know, something that you don't feel like is working right, we still got our, our teams in place. Uh, and we're just calling that extended care. Still a lot of resources there, a lot of folks looking at issues that are coming in. Um, and again, that focus is issue collection and resolution. One of the things I did wanna say because some of the more natural um, ways that you reach out to us uh, are starting to come back online. Um, I might even be in some meetings with some of you guys. Uh, depending on the, the group and organization, is we're trying to avoid as much as possible enhancement requests via the extended care, you know, how you submit a ticket. We've got those forms uh, in EVA where there's a buyer form and a supplier form where, you know, if you're having a direct issue, you can go submit those forms. And, you know, we're trying our best, um, you know, to avoid collecting enhancement requests through that process. Now, that doesn't mean we don't not ignoring your enhancement requests, but, and we're certainly logging them and we're certainly taking those things into account, but we'll never be able to settle out and begin to really look at enhancement requests uh, until we resolve, you know, any non-functioning issues in the tool, um, you know, and some of this too, um, it is a new platform and there are new ways to do business. 
And you might be hearing that from us occasionally about, well, I know it used to work this way in the old system, but have you thought about it this way? Or is there a new way that we can tackle the problem? So I've got some um, notes underneath there about enhancement requests in general, and particularly enhancement requests. And quite honestly, even with uh, if there, there is an issue for those of you that have larger organizations, we really uh, have appreciated uh, for those of you that are doing it, this idea of a kind of a central point of contact. Uh, for any issues that are coming to us. Um, and that central point of contact tends to go through um, some short, some sort of leadership office, typically procurement. Uh, in this case, since we're a procurement system, we think that's had benefits across the board because number one, that's at, at from a leadership level. Um, and in a procurement office level, you're being made aware of, of issues that are happening in your organization. Same thing with an enhancement request. Again, not that we don't love all of you dearly and want to hear about the things that you'd like to do to make improve EVA. Um, but if those things aren't centralized, if they're just coming in one off and they're not being shared organizationally, uh, we want to make sure those enhancement requests are meeting your organizational goals as well. So all of you need to keep that in mind as you're thinking, wow, EVA would be a lot better if we did this. Um, you know, making sure that's been run through the proper channels within your own entity uh, and making sure it's valid. Because again, some of you guys may have heard this from us. We see an enhancement request come in and you immediately get a response back from us that Oof, we need to look at that differently because we're on a new platform and it, it is different than what we used to be on and things operate differently. So certainly continuing to make sure that um, you're vetting not only your issues, but any type of enhancement requests uh, through the proper channels at your entity. And then, um, again, we love uh, hearing from you guys, and this is kind of happening naturally anyway, but making sure you're logging those requests, you know, getting them in front of your account executive, or quite honestly, the EVA team. And we promise we're recording them, you know, we're logging them. Um, but what I can't promise is when those types of things will be released. Um, each situation is different. Um, you know, sometimes an enhancement request is critical to your business function and they come along a little bit quicker um, uh, than what you might normally see. And sometimes they don't, or sometimes we need to look for a new way to do business. So just kind of all the things that are going on uh, around this topic as we move further and further away from transition. But again, excited to begin that process, ex excited to move into extended care. And guys, don't, don't take this conversation the wrong way at all. We're absolutely excited to, to look at your ideas and, and to bake those into the system. But we are an enterprise system. There are a lot of you out there. Um, and so we're always, you know, kind of looking at that globally and what makes the most sense uh, globally um, as, as we uh, put in fixes and enhancements and all that stuff. So again, appreciate your patience with that. Appreciate your support during this incredibly uh, exciting time for us uh, as we've moved to the new platform. Shifting gears and how we get items uh, into the system, let's talk a little bit about uh, EVA release management. And again, when I say release management, I'm really um, talking about uh, whatever we do, be it a fix to something that's broken or a uh, uh, something new, you know, a, a, an enhancement or, or something new to an existing feature, or quite honestly, launching new functionality, you know, a completely new piece of functionality that we currently don't have launched or enabled. That goes through uh, software release management here on our side. If you've uh, kind of been with us and, and been to some user groups or, or talked to us offline, um, you may know that we were doing uh, going all the way back into November weekly. Every Friday, we were packing items uh, into the EVA system uh, to, to get those updates and changes into the system. Uh, starting, quite honestly, this week, uh, we are moving to a bi-weekly release schedule. Um, so every other uh, week or, or you know, uh, once every two weeks, we're going to be doing a release. So still pretty aggressive. Um, and which is great because that allows us to address um, issues more frequently. 
um, and gives us a nice pacing for how we update the system instead of doing it on a monthly or a bi-monthly schedule where you have you know much longer lead times. This is a little bit more um, aggressive in nature, but allows us to be very attentive uh, to things that are going on in the EVA system. And again, just a, a, a higher frequency. The biweekly release schedule does give our team a little bit more time to test uh, and validate things that are coming in, which I think we all needed. Uh, our turnaround time for testing is, is pretty aggressive when we're on a weekly schedule. So we're excited. For those of you that uh, do training or have access to training and have or have access to UAT, I hope you've seen this message. Uh, it did go out about a week ago, but just in case you didn't, it's worth repeating. Um, when we went live, and quite honestly, before we went live, uh, we had our UATN training environments up. Um, we kind of told the field, told you guys as external users, hey, Wednesdays, the system's down. Every Wednesday. Because we needed that, that block on Wednesdays to, to do the updates, um, get things verified. Um, you know, sometimes we would bring the environment down. Uh, to do those updates. And we just didn't, you know, we didn't want you to expect that you'd be able to do, uh, for those of you that have access to UAT, that tends to be our interface and integration folks. Um, and then everybody else, if you have access to the training environment or have a user ID for the training environment, we just said, hey, stay out of there on Wednesdays. Um, there is a change to that um, because of the biweekly schedule and just how we're doing things. Our production release is actually going to be on Thursday the 16th will be our first production release with this new schedule. But what we do then the Thursday before we do a production release is we would be taking the environment on Thursdays, but not every Thursday, it would be every other Thursday. Um, so every other Thursday, it actually quite honestly started on the 9th. Um, so that was last week. Um, and then the next one will be the 23rd and then you can, you know, count the weeks out. Uh, there is a calendar on the EVA homepage, uh, that I'll jump to here, uh, in a minute, uh, before we do the demo, I'll show you that. And it, it just has the, you know, the times when the system is down. So sorry, uh, for those of you, you know, for kind of the late notice on that, particularly if you had training booked on one of these Thursdays, but I think overall, you know, now that you don't have any restrictions on Wednesday and depending on the month, uh, the environment, the UAT and training environment is only going to be down twice a month, again, depending on the month, um, on a Thursday. So it's not even every Thursday. It's just, you know, every other Thursday. And again, that started last week. And then the next one uh, where the environment will be down will be, will be the 23rd. And then can't tell you what the number is after that, but you know you can do two weeks out, two weeks out, two weeks out uh, from there. So that's kind of our impact from a release management perspective. And again, we sent some messaging out. I hope everybody got it. Um, certainly worth repeating uh, in this session about our changes. So we're excited about that. We're excited about uh, taking the environment away from you for less days. We're excited about the biweekly release schedule. Um, gives us more time to test, but still pretty aggressive where every two weeks we're, we're going to be updating the system. Um, so certainly excited about that. Speaking of the release schedule, I just wanted to go over some items. And let me, um, I'm probably going to have to reshare once I launch this. So I'm going to stop that share. And I'm going to share my Word document here. So bear with me. Give me just a second there. Uh, so I just want to do a quick review uh, of great it, uh, of the release schedule, uh, or of not the schedule, of the things that have gone in or will go in uh, since we last met, and just kind of review some things with you, so you have kind of a high level idea what's happening, and then we'll go into our demo uh, and talk about some stuff for our demo. So um, on the Eva website, I'll show you guys this as well. Uh, these items, um, there is an area where it's called system enhancements and you can go click that and check this out and you'll, you'll see a document very similar to that. Now we only update that. So I'll update that document at the end of February, um, for what has gone in in February. So if you go out there now, you'll see the January 
everything that came in in January. And then uh, once we hit the end of February, I'll put it up and you'll see everything that went in in February. And then of course, come to the user group meetings because the key items, the items that really, 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 really impact you guys, um, you know, we're going to talk about uh, here uh, certainly, and we're going to go over anything or demo anything, um, especially as we uh, start to do uh, a little bit of enhancing and, and even launching some new functions. We'll do some demoing. So excited about that. But real quick, let's spin through this list. Um, you'll, we've, I've got a date here and uh, a big one that is impacting folks uh, on the 16th. Now, a lot of you aren't going to see this uh, unless it'll be on your next password reset if you key directly into Evo. Um, for those of you that use single sign-on or federated identity management, you know, where you, you're not using a user ID in Eva, you're using your network user ID to get in, this really won't impact you. Um, this is for those of you that do, you know, go to eva.virginia.gov and hit buy or login and key in a user ID and password. Um, on your next password reset, we are going to 14 characters on that password. And again, that is not my choice. Right, let me preface this. This is us following guidelines from uh, uh, SEC 525, uh, which is a, you know, um, a security policy uh, that we follow here in the state um, around, you know, protecting data uh, and protecting access to systems that have data in them. Um, so we are just uh, adjusting uh, to the security standard that we have to meet. Um, so again, 14 characters that won't impact you until your next password reset. Uh, new users would be impacted by this too. Obviously, if you create a new user after the 16th. So these will be available on, or this will start on the 17th. We do the production migration the night of the 16th, and then these will be, uh, this that change will hit on the 17th. So new users, or if you have a user for whatever reason that hasn't logged in yet, um, since the transition, this would impact them. So 14 characters. Um, so that's going to gonna hit you guys on Friday. But again, those of you that are using your own network and using single sign-on, you're not going to see an impact there. And I bet you a lot of you guys, uh, if you're on uh, a COV network or, or you know, have network security uh, from the organization that you work for, you might already be doing one of those long, crazy passwords anyway. Um, so uh, that's that's happening there. So that's the big one um, that that's going to hit um, this week. Some other things uh, I wanted to talk about, and you'll notice the date, these have already gone in. So these are in the EVA system. But just a quick review here. Um, we were having some issues making sure all of our SWAM certifications were correct. We have a web service that goes out to SBSD and actually pulls in SWAM certifications uh, into EVA uh, for our suppliers that are registered and active in EVA. And we were making sure um, that was updated. Uh, so we got that um, taken care of for you. Uh, supplier response. Um, there was a notification issue. Um, some suppliers were not being consistently sent a notification when they responded to uh, a solicitation or sourcing opportunity, and we got that cleaned up as well. On the line item, uh, there were some, quite honestly, key fields, supplier part number, contract number, external contract number, uh, item cross-reference, which is used by those of you who do uh, imports uh, into EVA. Um, for whatever reason, uh, on the user interface, they were in an area called internal details. And we flipped those out because they need to be supplier visible or need to be tagged properly, uh, where it's very clear that they're supplier visible. So we move those uh, out of internal and into supplier visible on the line items. For those of you that use receiving, um, if you were doing a return, sometimes the, it was asking you for a supplier approval acknowledgement to process those returns. Uh, we made sure that uh, went away. Uh, so we got rid of uh, the receipt return um, and having a supplier acknowledge that. We had some users, uh, just part of the transition, one of those things that happened with blank missing time zones. And those blank missing time zones were impacting uh, if you were doing sourcing and public posting, the dates could get out of whack because it thought you were in, not in Eastern, that if there wasn't a time zone there, it, it put you in like Greenwich Mountain time, I think, 
uh, or something like that, you know, is putting you in a bad time zone because it wasn't setting you to, we're all, we're in Virginia, um, you know, when we issue our solicitations. And so just getting everybody set to the Eastern time zone. So we uh, clean that up uh, back on February 3rd as well. For those of you, um, this next one here, um, adding a filter to browse uh, in the browse order. There's browse requisition when you're looking for requisitions and there's also browse order. Um, for those of you that use the internal or confirming purchase order feature, um, that ability on browse orders to search for those confirming orders. Uh, so you can you know, differentiate between an, or an order that wasn't confirming and a confirming order uh, when you're actually searching for purchase orders. So a fix to that. Um, of course, I demoed this uh, last user group meeting because we were, quite honestly, uh, there's real functionality um, behind uh, the blanket purchase order feature when you're doing a requisition. Um, after I did that demo, kind of had some discussions that said, wow, we haven't really provided solid guidance um, either through training or through our policy uh, on how to uh, conduct uh, those type of blanket purchase orders using this new functionality uh, that was introduced as part of uh, uh, our current platform, our new EVA platform. And so we um, did a kind of a temporary disablement of that so we can get our, um, our training and our policy kind of cleared up around how to do that. For, the, uh, for those of you that um, you know, use that feature, the, the new feature, it didn't impact those transactions. You can still keep using that feature. Um, for those of you that need to do any type of blanket ordering, uh, you would follow the procedure from our legacy EVA, cut the order, and then you could do receiving um, against, against those orders. Um, uh, you know, just like you did in the past. Um, so stay tuned for that as we um, get ourselves uh, cleaned up and, and leverage this new functionality um, that is in that is in our our current platform that we moved to. Uh, for those of you integration and interface, um, we had the existing unit of measure. The unit of measure we were using for dozen was DZN. That was causing some problems for some folks out there. So we added. Now for dozen, when you're doing integration or interface of transactions, um, there is an alternate uh, unit of measure now where you can use DZ, which is the two digit. Uh, we had some systems that were struggling with the three digit DZ and so we got that cleaned up, but you can actually use either one. Kind of cool. So we made an alternate unit of measure there for dozen. Um, we fixed up report 211. Now we've shifted, this happened back in January. Um, we fixed up report 211. I know uh, around receiving, there are still several things we need to address for you. And I promise you, we've, we've got those logged and we're looking into them. Um, but there were duplicate receipts showing up on report 211, which is the receiving report. Uh, and we got those cleaned up back in the end of January. So for those of you that use that receiving port, report, uh, if you were seeing duplicate receipts, go ahead and go check that out. Uh, that was fixed back on January 27th. We discontinued supplier uh, notifications and performer actions for return transactions. That's a tie-in um, to the one receipt returns you had ab above. So getting rid of the notifications uh, for return transactions and receipt returns no longer requiring supplier acknowledgement. So those are kind of tied together from what we talked about uh, above. Uh, our users, for those of you that have a P card, they were unable to delete P cards. Um, and remove, you know, they'd add a P card and then they, you know, get a updated P card because maybe their P card expired or the number changed or whatever, or they, you know, just were getting a new card and they were unable to delete the old ones. So we fixed that back. Now we've shifted to January 20th. Um, so that got corrected. Also back on January 20th, for those of you that do the state entered vendor process, one of the key things you need to do when you do a state entered vendor is provide a W-9. And uh, you weren't able to do that. Uh, the, the ability to add an attachment uh, was not there. So we cleaned that up as well. And your ability to add a W-9, a document attachment, when you're entering a state intervener that was fixed back on January 20th. Continuing on, format unit price to show amount uh, uh, with uh, five-digit format. This is when an uh, uh, opportunity posted or you know, uh, out uh, in our all ops in the details of a line item uh, was giving us these wacky um, 
uh, format, especially I kind of think about fuel and things like that, that, that go out to multiple digits and we clean that up. So it's five digit precision when uh, things are publicly posted. So it's very, it's, it, it was doing what, if you've ever seen Excel and it gives you like a re weird formula, if you exceeded a certain amount of uh, uh, units, um, you know, and, and our digits, and we clean that up for you as well. For our contracts, uh, our publicly posted contracts on Evo, where they're publicly posted, there were some field label inconsistencies um, with organization and authorized entity and contracting entity. We got that all corrected. Uh, so from a public posting perspective, uh, our contracts look a little bit better. Uh, the vendor portal, uh, we for our suppliers, um, they have the ability to like favorite things and create a leads list. We got that corrected and that leads list is now available for our supplier community. Um, we uh, on, for those of you that do contract management, uh, on the contract header, uh, we allowed uh, some updates to happen on that header uh, without having to do an amendment, like authorize entities and things like that. Um, for the, uh, you could fix the uh, contract title, the external reference number, some stuff like that, uh, without having to do an amendment. And that was fixed. Now we've shifted to right around the time we did the user group. Uh, that's January 13th. And then the last ones, uh, getting solicitation notices, notices sent to all appropriate supplier contacts. Uh, we were missing some contacts there who uh, were looking for supplier notices. And we fixed that back in January. So uh, quite a large list of things there. Um, again, the January items from the 27th down through the 13th are posted. I'm going to show you that in a second. Um, let me stop the share. I do want to go back to my PowerPoint presentation. All right. Let me share that again. Get my PowerPoint going for you guys. Because I do want to shift over. Um, to the electronic order demo and then pop over and show you some stuff on the screen, uh, show you some stuff in Eva, some of the things I've been talking about over the last 20 minutes or so here, which is great. We've got about 20 minutes to, to hammer through this stuff. So let's do an electronic order delivery demo. And I've got a couple other things I want to show you based on the release management stuff we talked about. Some key points as we dig into this, um, a copy of the purchase order, uh, when an electronic order goes out, so the, the supplier receives an electronic order from the EVA system, um, a copy of the purchase order in PDF, Adobe PDF format, is included with the supplier email notification. So suppliers, um, the ordering address contact, there could be a contact that you select when you place the order, um, might get this, um, but they get a notice that, hey, you have an order. They do get an attachment, a, a PDF there uh, that comes with that. It's included with the notification, um, but it is courtesy. Um, it does not include like if you had attachments on your PO, like specifications, terms and conditions, uh, anything else, or purchase card details. Right. That would not be PCI compliant um, if we sent the P card through email like that. So in order to get the P card, or to get any attachments that are on the purchase order, the supplier needs to log into their account to pull that. Now, guys, that is no different than um, our, our legacy system. All right, it's no different than our legacy system. In order to get the PCAR details, in order to get those purchase order attachments, you had to log in to pull those, okay? And that was true in our old system, it's true in this one. Um, but again, you know, just kind of reiterating that and making it clear. Order delivery is electronic for self-registered suppliers, all right? Order delivery is electronic for self-registered suppliers. Now, we converted and maybe not all self-registered suppliers were set up as, as electronic and, and we did have to do some tweaking um, as we've matured these last couple of months. But at this point, in general, if it's a self-registered supplier, they're getting an electronic copy of the order. Okay. Suppliers that are state entered or non registered suppliers, you should see a PO print fire where you have to do an approval 
there because it's it's that's the system telling you whoa this is you know for whatever reason uh, this vendor isn't getting an electronic order and um the ordering entity whoever placed that order some of you have people that do that for you but the, in the grand scheme of things i'm not going to you know tell you who it is you know who that is but the ordering entity you're responsible for order delivery for state entered or non registered suppliers you guys are responsible for that but again in general order delivery is electronic for self registered suppliers and if you're like, I don't know how to tell my suppliers how to get their orders, they're struggling, they don't know what they're doing, training is available, all right? So let's shift gears and actually start demoing and looking at this. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm going to pull up Eva. I need to reshare. Here we go, so I'm gonna share. All right, now I'm screen sharing, perfect. Okay. All right. So I've got Eva up here, and we're going to get to that in a minute. I do want to pop over. Come here. I know. Pop into the Eva homepage real quick because I want to show you some of these things. So I said supplier training. If a supplier is struggling, I don't know how to get my order. I'm confused. Come into Eva, eva.virginia.gov. I sell to Virginia, which would be for our suppliers, supplier training right at the top. And then they've got an overall introduction to the new platform, how to do account maintenance, how to view and respond to solicitations, how to manage and import and do catalogs, and then accessing your orders, the one at the very bottom. There's a video that the supplier can take and shows them how to log in and get to their orders in the new platform. So you definitely want to drive your suppliers to that if they're struggling, all right, if they're struggling. They're I will also them. add, pop in Ooh. here real quick, Shane, and add, yeah, we have communicated. It. We have communicated. We have communicated. So we've sent general communications. We've sent targeted communications when we can identify that, you know, suppliers have been responding, but they haven't logged into their account. So we've been working behind the scenes to make sure that they understand this process and to help them tweak any type of contact and notification emails that they need to change email addresses. Absolutely. Thank you, Kim. Um, going back to release management. So we're on orders. That's where the suppliers can get trained on orders. I talked about system enhancements. The old Eva transition newsroom is kind of sleeping down here. So on any part of eva.virginia.gov, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, we've got a footer down there. For those of you that are interested in this and want to see the system enhancements, the document is down there. It's just, it's, we, you know, we, we had some folks ask us to make that publicly available. Um, we just parked it, you know, in an area where if that is what you're concerned about, you can get to it. Obviously you can come to these user group meetings and hear about all this great stuff, but then certainly you can come down here, click on system enhancements, and you'll notice that document looks very familiar. This is January, and it kind of just rolls through all of those different items that came in throughout January. Now, I had my document date sorted. This is more sorted by audience, you know, so you can kind of see audience, although there's a buyer one that slipped in down there. Um, but in general, uh, you can go in and see that. And then I talked about that calendar. If you're like, oh, I can't remember, you know, when is UAT and training not going to be available? You'll see upcoming release schedule if you click this link that launches that release schedule and you'll see the 9th the 23rd the 9th so it's march 9th will be the next one and then you can kind of you know go through the months there and you'll see our calendar and those dates blocked and what those dates will be so you can go through and you know you can kind of move through although i don't know why it didn't update for april but dave's on this day we need to do that for every other thursday through the rest of the year. I thought he said he did that. Maybe he just did it through through March there. But but Dave, Dave, if you're on, we need to do that. He first. said he's he said he's on it. He's on okay, it. Okay, good. Thank you, Dave. Um, every third every other Thursday throughout 2023 is what that schedule is. So there we go. Here we are. Back there we are. We're on the 15th. The next one will be the 23rd. So Dave will get that fixed up for us. 
All right. So that's just a couple little areas I wanted to show you there with release management and with that supplier training. But back to this, let's talk about electronic orders. So I'm going to shift over here to um, browse orders. I prepped an order for you here today. Um, and actually, one of the things, this is a this is a good thing to talk about, actually, that we're, that we're on this page. So in browse orders, I know when I browse requisitions, I can filter it for just my request, right? And I can bring that up so that I'm the requester and I can see, and I'm in UAT, guys. So if you see something that looks wacky or Shane's got a crazy name or boy, he does a lot of purchasing. Uh, I am in the test environment that we're looking at today. Um, so you'll, you know, I, you can really quickly filter for you as a requester. Well, the browse orders doesn't necessarily have that kind of returns. All the orders within your entity, it, it, for those, depending on what your access is, you could be seeing a lot more um, than, you know, than what is in your scope. So there is a filter over here where you can, you know, put the requester in and put it to your name. And then that'll give you the orders that are associated with you. Well, remember from my discussion yesterday, I did a favorite. So in purchase orders, I just call it Shane's orders. And when I click that, what it does is it sets me as the requester. I had saved that and it gives me the orders that I have done, right? So that's a quick way to build yourself a filter so that you can get, maybe you want to get to your orders or, or maybe a coworker's orders or somebody else's, if you're a manager or supervisor, build it, get that search built and then save it as a favorite and call it whatever you want to. So this is, these are my orders. I got a P card order for bug meeting demo. I'm going to show you guys this. This is to a self-registered vendor. It's in ordered status, a um, little $450 order. So if I click on this purchase order, how do I know that it went out? How do I know? How can I be um, ensured that this order went out electronic? Got a couple areas we can check. First one, I'm going to just going to click on the PCO. And one of the ways we can do this is I can scroll down and I get an area that says history of PO sent, history of PO sent. And I know this went, this order at 2.04 PM yesterday, there was a notification and then the order itself went into the supplier's account at 2.04 p.m. yesterday to Charles Dennison. And there's, again, that's the convenience copy. That's the convenience copy. He got a copy of that PCO. Charles Dennison got a copy of that PCO. So if I, I can click on that, it'll pull the PDF for you. Um, P card information is not on that PDF. Or if I did any, and, and I didn't do any attachments, which that would have been smart. So I could have shown you that. Sorry about that. Uh, but you get the idea. This is for convenience. It gives them a copy of the order, but truly our suppliers need to be logging into their accounts to acknowledge it. This is one area where you can see and, and see if that order went out. The other thing you can do, if you're interested about like, well, is my supplier self-registered? You know, are they getting electronic orders? On the PO next to the supplier, you see that little link, see the little clicky thing? You can click on this and that's going to immediately pull the supplier profile for you and, and the supplier that I sent this order out to. So there's my good buddies at Blue Ridge Fence and Window. You can very quickly shift to company information. I can see that they're self-registered. Good. I can scroll down. Preferred order method URL. That probably ought to say electronic there. That might make more sense. That's kind of a carryover from our old system. But, but that's good. The two options there, if you see print, not so good. Print means I, I need to deliver the order. If you see URL and you see self-registered, you're in good shape, all right? So that's a quick way to check that supplier profile. You can also check if you wanna find out more about your suppliers, hit on their contacts, make sure they got a valid contact, you know, where things are going good here, you know, and some of the things you can help these guys with. But that's that kind of quick hit, right? Self-registered URL, all right? So that's the, and that's right off the word, right? right off the word. So two areas where I can make sure, and if I'm, you know, did my order go out? Did they get it? Those are two areas where I can check. And one the of the questions one, that came over, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I didn't want to lose this. Um, where does it show the vendor ID on the page? So when you click that little chain that he clicked for the supplier here, ID, it's in the top right. Right here. 
right? and at the very, very top of the supplier card yeah, as well, so that is, at the very, very top above yeah, everything. And, yeah. and then if you're talking about if they were converted from the old system. Well, and, and there's more, actually more supplier identification information. Right. There's so the that, old, that, the vendor that's customer that old code number. And there's the yep. So that's under company information. And yep. your your key places to check are going to be contacts and then, of course, addresses because the order address Good contact stuff. email is it, what drives who receives that notification by default. So thank yep. you for that question, Lori. Yeah, that's a great question. Great question for sure. But every supplier will get an, this SUP number, which is EVA, or if you've heard us use the term iValua, that's the platform we're on. That's their number. Our vendor customer code is on there. For So for converted suppliers, you're going to see the old VS. For new suppliers that register native in our new platform, those numbers are going to match. The SUP number is also going to be their vendor customer code. Um, and then the VLIN is the Virginia location identification number. That is unique to a supplier location and created for every supplier that registers in the system. So there's, you know, multiple supplier IDs and, and all of our suppliers will have this SUP number, a VIN cus code and a VIN. Okay. So good, good question. All right. So that's the, there's one more area you can check if the order was delivered to the supplier, you can go into workflow. Um, and if these are green, order delivered in EVA means it went to the supplier's account. If you're looking at the, so this is a purchase order workflow. So order delivered in EVA, if it's green, that's good. And then if this is green, notification sent to supplier, that is good. Sometimes you might see this being green, that the order was delivered to the supplier, but they have a bad contact, a bad email address, something wacky happened, and it'll be down here where a notification is not sent. So you may want, if you see that, you need to reach out to that supplier because they may not have got a notice that they got an order, but the order's in their account. The order is in their account if this is green. Okay. All right. Anything else that you have questions about? Like, let's say the order, you, you're expecting it. You see a self-registered supplier. Uh, and you're, you're expecting that order to go over and something doesn't look right or something. You don't think the supplier got the order. They're struggling with that. Have them reach out to us. Have the supplier reach out to us. Um, and let me show you that as well, just in case we've forgotten where those things are. If I go to the EVA homepage, get help, supplier assistance request. All right, supplier assistance request. So again, EVA homepage, get help, supplier assistance request. And we can point suppliers in the right direction. But you can too, tell them where that training is, tell them they need to log into their account. And But if they're struggling with that, they can come and that supplier can fill out this form and, and we'll help them out. So back to the PO here, those are the things you can do on your purchase order if you want to verify that it's been electronically delivered because we know we, we're getting some tit for tat um, with uh, our suppliers. Well, I didn't get the order. I didn't get the order. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Those are some things you can check. Go to the order. Do you see an email notice going out? Can you check the supplier account? Make sure they're self-registered, make sure they're URL, and then you could check the workflow if you, if you really want to do that analysis, all right? And that'll help you. Uh, and then if the supplier still doesn't know what they're doing, have them hit us. Uh, if, you know, if they've taken the training, they don't know how to log in and something like that, they can reach out to us and we'll help them out. I also want to show you what it looks like on the supplier side. In the last couple minutes we have here, I'm going to shift over to the supplier's account. Pay no attention to what I'm doing. It's in test. But boom, there you go. Um, so on in test, again, I am now in a supplier account. This is the Blue Ridge Fence and Window account. There's Charlie. Um, so I'm in Charlie's account here, again, in test. But once they log in, and they can log in from the EVA homepage. This is the first screen a supplier will see. They get some summary information. I think the quickest way to acknowledge orders is you go to orders, acknowledge. Then those orders are, are there. They see all the orders that they've gotten uh, in 
uh, from Eva, from you guys. Here's the one we were just looking at. They get some uh, information. There's a, there's a print PDF option for them if they want it. They click into the order itself. Again, there's a copy of the order. I can you know, shrink the screen if I need to. I can print from here if I want to. There's the line items, blue, blue, red, and white widgets. You know, just something simple. They even get a confirmation of when the, um, the notice was sent to them. You can see that. And then in order to pull the P card details, notice they're still kind of hidden. They have to hit this button and then your P card will be decrypted. And there you see your P card number. And again, that's a garbage number. I'm in test, um, yeah. but you get the idea. That's what the decryption is. One of the and things then, that's kind of, kind of oh, cool about this, we have an extra layer of security. That P card number isn't available just if you click on the order. You have to come into the order and click the details in order to get that decrypted number. And you can't, like, it, the, the P card doesn't print on any of the print versions that it goes out. You've, and you've then with it. confirming orders, um, you know, with confirming orders, are, are the suppliers able to retrieve the P card data from a confirming order? Oh, of course. And now, here's the difference. This if is it's associated with the requester, right? So Yeah, so here's a, here's a really key point. The default view, let me go back to the home view here in the last minute or so that we have. The default view when I go into acknowledge orders is just regular purchases. That's the default view. The quickest way for the suppliers to clear that out, they can clear, clear out the type and hit search. Notice my type, confirming and purchase. So there is a filter there. There is a filter. So if the supplier is like, I don't see any of your confirming orders. Well, hey, you, you got to remove the filtering and, and refresh your search. Or they can specifically come in and search for conforming our orders by selecting the type. And then they get that type. I, I don't know why they do this because you can just clear it out and you can say, well, show me all. And that gives you the same things. Or you can just clear those out and you get all. So when I cleared out that filter, I get both confirming and purchase. You notice they're they're mixed. And then the P card information, it it the tip off is that that it's a PCO versus a PO. So for confirming Correct. orders, we have a different. Um, yeah, it would be a PCO, and I don't know that if I have any right necessarily in there. Yeah, I don't see any, but it's the same thing, guys. Regardless, if it's a confirming order or a regular purchase for, if it is a PCO. Actually, I might be able to do this and see if I can sort them down. If it is a PCO, and I'm sorry, we've run over just one minute here. And but then you guys have asked some really great I do not questions. have any confirming PCOs. Yeah. But if, <laughs> if I have a PCO, you come in, click the card details. All right. Yep. And you guys have asked some really good questions that are really training focused. So we've tried to send over the link to prompt you to ask those using our buyer assistance form. I'm going to put it in the chat again so that we have it um, such as, hey, I've got multiple vendor numbers or multiple, multiple vendors with the same name. How do I know which one I should use? The quickest way is to do see all and, and to do a vendor search and make sure you're selecting the active account versus maybe a deactive or suspended account and making sure that you're just checking out their profile, I think is probably the best practice that we normally talk about on our, our requisitions receiving PO hypercare team, which I happen to be part of, which is why I'm so well-versed in that <laughs> section of it. So, and um, just to wrap up, we've, we've had a lot of questions that we've answered along the way. So thank you for being engaged. And again, a lot of it has to do with that training, needing to go out and check out that buyer assistance form so that you can get your request in. So I'm going to go ahead and just put that in the chat one last time. A lot of good suggestions too. We've had some suggestions that have come over. And a lot of people are asking, hey, uh, do you have this prioritized yet? <laughs> and unfortunately, the answer is 
So <laughs> we've gotten a lot of great suggestions. So we have to take a step back, like Shane mentioned in the beginning, and make sure that we're prioritizing them based on business need, practicality, uh, enterprise need, and all of those uh, different aspects. Awesome. Yes. And again, some, some, some questions that are coming over. So if you have a question and we didn't get to that, make sure that you are using that buyer assistance form. I did put that into the chat. We are at um, the top of the 11 o'clock hour. And I'm just kind of scrolling through to see if there's anything. Will the P card option move to the header page? I'm not sure what that question is related to. Do you mean the, the, the actual uh, tab? The right now it's a tab card, yeah. on the side. And yeah, it's a tab. It's the third tab on the side when you're doing it right. Um, so, so at this time, no. Lives. Yeah, that's where it lives for right <laughs> now. So oh, the supplier is not available for purchasing. What does that mean when we purchase from them for subscriptions? Probably not activated yet. When you see yeah, that. they may not be activated. Um, there may yep. be they're missing a W nine. Of... They failed their IRS verification. Yes, and if you see that and you you purchase from them for a subscription, then one of two things: they have multiple supplier accounts, and we've had to kind of join those. And you have maybe selected one that is discontinued, just de de deactivated, uh, and not active. So search and make sure that there's not multiple accounts of the same name and pick the active one. That's been something that we've seen and that's the fix for it. And then if that's not the case, then you'll need to have the supplier reach out to customer care so that, or billing potentially, because it's, it's typically like a billing issue and make sure that they get things resolved. Yeah, is there a direct link to the Eva Extra? There is, and I am going to work with Dave so that we can get the page of the website cleaned up a little bit but it is the buyer information center that's available from the EVO website homepage. So I want to make sure that we put that. And I'm going to put this. Um, so, Don, thank you for, for asking that question. So this is, has our future bug meeting dates on this page as well as the EVA Extra. So I'll just put this out here, EVA Extra page link. Uh, as well as those bugs. So I uh, put that into the chat so that everybody can get that. So thank you for that question. And we will uh, go through the other questions that we've received. And if they are training related, we'll try to get you guys over to that, that form if you didn't submit it already. But I think hopefully by me saying this, it will prompt you to use the buyer form because a lot of things are coming over that are really specific to you as a user or your entity. Uh, so we are going to go ahead and just go ahead and wrap things up. Anything else you want to add? Thank you, Barb, no, for, joining. Joining. for joining. Uh, Barb's been, been tag teaming with me in the background, yes, <laughs> getting, trying to get that. some questions answered. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. And we appreciate you being part of the February buyer user group. The date for March, April, May, and June. Yes, are all out on that buyer resource page that I did share in the chat. I thank you as always just for your feedback, your continued engagement. It is truly with your assistance and input that we can make this platform the success that it is. So thank you and we will see you again in March. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks guys.